It's time again. The Karate Nerd returns to Okinawa to explore the history, origins, and secret techniques of traditional karate. You're watching Season 2 of Karate Nerd in Okinawa. Featuring your host, Jesse Yenkat, a.k.a. the Karate Nerd himself. Get ready for another epic journey to discover the untold story of Okinawa. The birthplace of karate. This is Karate Nerd in Okinawa. Season 2. Episode 4. Guess where I am standing right now. It's time for another trip down memory lane because right behind me is Okinawa University or Okidai as we call it in Japanese and this is actually where I studied when I lived here although I didn't really come here to study that was just an excuse to get the visa because what I really came for when I lived here of course was the karate training but when I was not training karate I came here to learn Japanese language and culture and history and actually right up there on the right side that is where I did most of my classes but to be honest I skipped quite a few of them to go to the dojo so I would actually go to different dojos with different masters which is what I still do right because I never want to limit myself to one style but you cannot say that to the senseis because they always want you to just do their thing right but that's never been my style because I'm a karate nerd I want to do it all as much as possible and what made it possible was the fact that I actually studied here because that made it possible for me to to understand not just the language but also the mindset and the culture and this context is what provides the backdrop to truly dive deeper into the roots of karate because you need to go both wide and deep when you're a karate nerd like me the hardest part of getting into Okinawa University was actually the language test because you need to be able to speak Japanese before you can even be accepted into the programs. So I had to study for two years back home before I even was able to come here and study. And the test was a verbal test and a written test. So I had to actually record myself reading Japanese on a cassette tape. You, some of you kids out there don't even know what a cassette tape is and I'm still in my 20s so I'm young but I had to actually use a cassette tape recorder that I borrowed from a cousin of mine back home. I recorded my own voice in Japanese reading a text that they sent me and then I sent that cassette tape to them before I was accepted plus some other tests and I passed them all and then I of course paid a, you know, a lot of money because this university is not free here like it is in Sweden where I'm from and uh, that's it. Sometimes you just want to eat something that's good for the soul and not just for the body. And this place right here is called Ball Donut Park and this is where I come from my secret comfort food moments. Because they make these tiny balls that are like donuts but in ball shape. So crispy on the outside and super yummy on the inside. Are you guys ready for this? First of all, just look at that. Wow. There's even a raspberry in there. Now, let's have a taste. I'm just gonna grab that one. Let me get some of that blueberry on top. It's harder than it looks. Whatever, I'll just eat one, okay? Mm. It's warm, it's freshly made. And the consistency is on point. Just look at that. Mm. That's what I call delicious balls. People love saying that Okinawa is the birthplace of karate and they are right but where exactly is this birthplace in Okinawa? Well the answer is right behind me. Just look here. Matsuyama Koen. Matsuyama Park if you have to pick one spot in Okinawa that represents the birthplace of karate as we know it, Matsuyama Koen is that place. Let me explain why. Follow me. Ah! Look behind you guys. The term karate, empty hand, 
is not an old one, it's a new one. The original term for the martial arts that later developed into karate was todi, which means Chinese hand. In other words, it signified some kind of Chinese martial arts tradition that was cultivated in Okinawa and later developed into modern day karate. But the question is, where exactly did this Chinese fighting tradition morph with the local fighting arts into karate? And this is the exact, exact place. These families right here are the 36 families that were relocated from China to this exact spot in Okinawa. And in fact, the Chinese garden is on the other side of that street, just to prove my point. And this area here is just for these Chinese families who were brought here to share the Chinese culture. They were craftsmen, traders, architects, entertainers, and martial artists. And they shared their martial arts knowledge with the local people around this area. This was kind of like Chinatown, right? The Chinese village. So in 19, no, uh, 1392, I believe it was, 36 families were basically planted here from Fujian province in southern China. And that is why uh, many people believe that the southern Chinese martial arts like white crane and other types of Kung Fu styles were actually the roots of Okinawan karate. And this place right here is where the locals came to train with these Chinese fighting arts experts to basically develop what would later become karate, right here in Matsuyama Park. Now I'm on my way to meet my friend Evan, who works for the US Army here as a professional historian. I'm gonna meet him at Urasoe, which is the old capital before the three kingdoms were united to modern day Okinawa. And he's gonna show a, a pretty interesting historical tour of Hacksaw Ridge, where the Battle of Okinawa actually took place. And then it's time to practice in a new karate dojo. the tunnel that goes to the other side. Imagine having to hide down there. And this was the battlefield. This was the battlefield. Yeah. American battalions attacking the Japanese here. Yeah. And that's how they did it. Yeah. They realized at Kakuzu you can't flank them, you can't go around them, yeah. you have to go over and through them. Yeah. And that's what made these ridges very, very costly. So when they're hiding tunnels like that, yeah. how do you do that? Right. But that's when you hear about the Americans throwing grenades and such charges into the tombs. And that's where you have bad things happening. Right, right. But this is it. This is the entirety of the battlefield. Yeah. And so Hollywood does a great job of making it look sensational. Yeah. <laughs> I'm standing in front of the Komin Khan, which is like a local community center where tonight's karate session is going to take place. And the style I'm going to practice is not really a style. It's called Okinawan Kempo, and it was founded by Shigeru Nakamura, who disliked the idea of having different styles. He wanted something more open-minded, kind of like the karate nerd philosophy. You should be open to kata, kihon, kumite, bunkai, koburo, weapons, pressure points, takedowns, joint locks, and all of that is what they practice in Okinawan Kempo. And the head sensei who's gonna be leading the session is a ninth degree, he's the highest ranked on the whole island. It's Kina Sensei, Kina Toshimitsu. And his uh, right hand man is, I think his name is Kyuna, uh, no, Kyan Toru. And that's the guy who's gonna be actually leading the session, I believe. There will also be a lot of foreigners here because Okinawan Kempo is very popular with the Americans on the island. This will be fun, let's go.
쇼볼 가는 거. 네. 발을. 선. 시. 오케이. 이. 삼. 시. 어때? 이. 이. You guys have no idea how sweaty this is. Ooh, I was I was sweaty before we even started training. That's how hot it is here. So you really gotta hydrate. Yesterday's Okinawan Karate Kempo practice got pretty late. I didn't get to bed until like midnight. But today is a new day and yesterday's training was really interesting. I love the fact that Okinawan Kempo is a style that is not a style because it reminds me of Bruce Lee's idea of making his own system a non-system. Another pretty cool thing was that the practice was divided into this natural progression known as Shuhari in Japanese. These are the three levels of mastery that you need to understand no matter what you're learning. And they applied this perfectly in Okinawan Kempo. Because we started with isolation, and then integration, and then improvisation. But we started by doing techniques by ourselves to try to refine our movements, right? And then we apply them against an opponent to understand timing and distance, because you cannot develop that on your own. And then finally, you apply that in a free sparring situation, full contact with headgear, so that you can use your creativity and intuition as well. And this natural progression is something that I believe every karate style should strive to apply in their practice if they want their students to actually progress. Now, it's time for something a little bit different, but you'll have to wait until the next episode to watch that because I'm meeting a 10th dan, 80 year old karate grandmaster right around the corner. And he's gonna give me a pretty special, uh, let's call it a performance. You'll see in the next episode. Stay tuned. <laughs>